Hi. So today I'm going to be talking about the Rangi morph of Charnia. So why is study of the Ediacaran important? Well, molecular estimates place the origin of the animals at somewhere between seven and 800 million years ago, but the first uncontroversial animal body fossil assemblages don't really appear until the base of the Cambrian, when they're already teeming with recognisable forms like Aldenella, or the Circus of Worms, or from slightly younger deposits like the Burgess Shale, Canadia. So it's fossils of the Ediacaran period with their entirely more enigmatic morphology that have been considered to represent antecedents to these modern animal groups. But because of their enigmatic morphology, whether this is the case or not remains controversial. Resolution of this issue is important because if they do represent antecedents to modern animal groups, they will help inform our understanding of um, animal developmental process, which is very important. So where have these uh, Ediacaran organisms been placed in eukaryotic phylogeny? Um, most places, and this kind of reached a... Uh, well, in, the in the late 80s, Dolph Sylac has suggested that they belong to their own now extinct kingdom, the Vendozoa, before revising this in the early 90s to Phylum Vendobionta, and this was the most uh, controversial, one of the most controversial of these hypotheses. They've been suggested to be algae, fungi, lichen, nor metazoan and metazoan alike. Um, and if we look at where these groups are across the range, we find it's the frondos forms that have the most disparate of all of these affiliations, and of the frondos forms, it is the rangiomorphs to which most of these affiliations have been proposed. So the rangiomorphs are sessile frondos benthic forms um, that are characterised by something called the rangiomorph unit, which is a hierarchically self-similar branching pattern. So you have branches which are constructed of branches which are constructed of branches. And of the rangiomorphs, it is charnia that is the most iconic being the first fossil to be demonstrably found from pre-Cambrian rocks. It's a cosmopolitan taxon being found in every major Rangi morph deposit. It's stratigraphically long-lived, and its size ranges from just over one centimetre to expected to be just over a metre, based on incomplete specimens. And uh, because of the discovery of sites of exceptional preservation, like Mistaken Point, we can begin to look at populations of these organisms and uncover new facets of both anatomy and ontogeny. So in order to do this, we've been using optical microscopy, which is really useful, and it helps us really get into the fine details of what's going on in these organisms. So I'm briefly going to go through what's known of Charnia's anatomy before going into our new findings. So Charnia is a frondose form. Uh, it's considered to have an apex up here, and here is basal. And Charnia is considered to have four orders of branching. So this is a primary branch, perpendicular to that of secondaries, perpendicular to those of tertiaries, perpendicular to those of quaternary branches. No more than four orders of branching have ever been found. And these branches lie along a glide plane of symmetry. That's an offset form of bilateral symmetry. And we see the same four orders of branching across the range of the organism. Most rangiomorphs, unipolar rangiomorphs, have holdfast. In Charnia, this is a skeleton of a holotype that is often missing, but this is considered preservational and nothing to do with the biology of the organism. Um, and in, when Charney was initially described by Ford in 1958, it was considered to have a frond, a holdfast, and a stalk. But because Ford initially completed Charnia with a potentially distantly related taxon, no one really knows, Charnia discus, this has kind of gone by the wayside. And so one of the first things what we're doing is redescribing a stalk. This is an informal term at the minute, a stalk region, which is a basal extension of some branches. These are not the basal most branches, which you can see here. Um, are very, very sporadically preserved. Where they are preserved, it's weak. But they appear where they're present to join directly to the holdfast. They do not join the midline of the organism, which all other primary branches do. And so what we are calling the stalk is, this, uh, is these lowermost branches where they join and form a confluence of second-order branches. And this can be present or absent in exceptionally preserved specimens. We can confidently say it's present or absent. And it uh, constitutes different proportions of the organism. So it's a dynamic region. So here is a Charnia from Newfoundland. Um, and we can see the stalk region here. So I'm sorry if you got a scale bar. This organism is about 23 centimetres in length. And excluding the holdfast, the stalk makes up around 35% the length of the organism. But in Charnia, it's from uh, Charnwood Forest, where we have a large population of them. The stalk region can make up between 10 and around 25% of the organism, where present it can also be absent. And the redescription of this area of Charnia has allowed us to confirm something first described by Narbonne in 2009 in the presence of these central rods you can see here. So here is a Charnia from Charnwood Forest. Uh, it's a bit of a scrappy specimen, but if we zoom in on this region here, so you can see in white the holdfast, and then these odd-looking branches, which I'll come back to later. But what's clear here is this naked rod, and here is the bifurcation, sorry, uh, leading to the lowermost primary branches. And we don't just see this in Charnia. So here is a 
undescribed Rangi morph from Newfoundland. So we have the hold fast here, and this is the frond. And if we zoom in on this area here, we can quite clearly see this naked rod structure running up the length of the organism. And we interpret these as infolded primary branches. So with the description of new facets of anatomy, it allows us to better uh, analyse previous models of ontogeny. And what we find is that uh, two previous models have considered Charnia to only have one apical growth zone. And so in light of this dynamic stalk region, we potentially find that these might be incomplete and need further evaluation. And so we have put together a model of Charnia's growth. Um, I point out that I've been discussing Charnias from both Charnwood Forest in England and Newfoundland here because it's really only the Charnias from Charnwood Forest that are known masonized at present. They're the only Charnias I'm going to include in the model to be safe. We think we have masonized from Newfoundland, but this requires further evaluation and it's an area of ongoing work. So the first thing we tested, um, has been assumed by all other models, is that Charnia grew by the differentiation <coughs> of new Rangu morph units over time and their subsequent inflation. And we find support for this, so as you can see, larger Charnias have a greater number of branches and they are of greater length. But if we drill down into proportional differences, we start to see some interesting changes. So if we compare between the 11 and 22 centimetre specimen, the 22 centimetre specimen is actually the holotype we find that the 11 centimetre specimen has about 47% the number of branches of the holotype. But if we were to compare between the holotype and a 45 centimetre specimen, we find that the, the holotype has 80% the number of branches of the 45 centimetre specimen, perhaps suggesting there's something different going on in how differentiation is manifesting over time across the life, life cycle of this organism. So we know that China is growing by the differentiation and inflation of new units, but where are these units being added? So we first tested the notion that Charnia grew from its apex, as has been found by previous models of Charnia growth, and we do find support for this. So our hypothesis was that um, if Charnia was growing from its apex, we would expect the absolute size of the most apical branches to be fairly consistent across the size range. And this is what we see for most of the known size range, so there is actually a little <coughs> variation uh, between like 0 0.7 of a millimetre and about 2 millimetres. But the largest specimen here, the 45 centimetre specimen, uh, has most apical branches which are far larger, in some cases five times the size. And so this perhaps would support the idea that Charnia is entering a different phase of life as it enters larger and differentiation is slowing down or something like that. We next tested the idea that Charnia grew from its base based on the redescription of this dynamic region near the base of the organism. Um, and so at first thing, we did, we did the length of the organism and compared it to the length of the stalk, and we found that the length of the stalk region, as we're currently defining it, does increase with the length of the specimen. But we wanted to look at proportional differences to test for dynamism in this area, and our hypothesis was that if this stalk region, as we're terming it, is an area of dynamic growth or whatever, we would see it variably present and absent, and it would make up a different proportion of the organism across size ranges. And this is what we see, so I know this is a bit of a messy graph. Um, but yeah, what we can see initially is that the stalk is variably there and variably not there, and I would point out that these are all exceptionally <coughs> preserved specimens where you can be 100% confident that the stalk is there or not there or how long it is. Cool. And we can, if I just pop this line here, what we can see is that four of the five specimens that are smaller than 10 centimetres either have no discernible stalk or a very, very small discernible stalk whereas all specimens that are larger than that have a stalk that makes up at least 10% of the organism. And so there are some trends underlying here. Obviously, we need a larger sample size, and we'll increase this when exceptionally preserved specimens become available. Um, and so to back this up, I go back to this specimen, which I showed you earlier, um, with these unusual branches. Now, these branches here are much, much freer than any branches we see in the rest of any Charnia organism, where in most cases they abut on top of each other, so we interpret these to be second-order branches, they're really stacked on top of each other. These are very free, and this is unusual. We don't think that this is an artefact of felling, because if this was a weakness in the organism, we may expect to see it in more than one specimen, and we only see it in this one specimen. Um, and so this may suggest that the stalk region was an area of active differentiation. So what can this tell us about Charnia's growth? So we envisage there are two phases in Charnia's growth. We have small Charnias, which are going active differentiation from the apex as they gain in size. We have the development of this basal region here, so we're growing in a bipolar fashion. And then in the largest organisms, we have a shift away <coughs> from the differentiation-heavy period of growth that we see in all other organisms, and they enter a more inflation-heavy period of growth. What can this tell us about phylogeny? So we know that Charnia grew by the differentiation of new elements and their inflation over time from probably two axial growth zones, and we know this is not how fungi grow. 
Uh, this in tandem with the fact that Charnia has two main body axes, so an apical basal one and a lateral branching axis. If we resolve Charnia as within the metazoa, this isn't really what we see in the sponges. Um, brown algae do have both of these things. However, the morphological comparators, the laminarials and the kelps, also have a base, uh, sorry, lateral secondary growth zones at the base of each blade and exhibit something more akin to what's called parallel modular growth, so where you don't have a constrained form. And this is not what we see in Charnia, and this in tandem with the fact that uh, all, to my knowledge at least, all known non-photosynthetic algae are microscopic in size would perhaps suggest that an algal affinity is not likely. And so we resolve Charnia as falling within the total group view metazoa, although we don't have enough evidence to distinguish between competing possibilities within that, and find that Charnia is informative on the evolution of early animal evolution and helps to close that gap between molecular estimates and the fossil record. Um, thank you for listening. <laughs>